today uh, by my colleague and friend uh, Armen Novanezov uh, that uh, some of you have met already in Japan uh, last year and in Argentina uh, three years ago. Uh, we are really delighted to uh, join uh, the summit again uh, this year and uh, before I start I really want to thank the organizers for the hard work uh, behind the scene to uh, make it happen in these times which are uh, not uh, business as usual to, to say the least. I also want to have a, a, a word uh, to um, uh, remember and thank uh, our good friends from France, Grégoire saint and Jean-Louis Grégoire, uh, with whom uh, we started our uh, collaboration journey in Skolkovo in Russia in 2013, so some years ago, uh, and uh, we are very uh, delighted to go on on this uh, journey. Now, when we spoke with uh, the team in charge of organizing the event, and especially uh, Nicola Altobelli and Alex Gill and others about what we could share with you today that could be useful to you, uh, we came to the conclusion that it was about the way that we're helping organizations today uh, to face what the world is, uh, is facing. We are not in the business of predicting the future, so we are not going to tell you what the future will be, but we are in the business of uh, anticipating potential futures and helping organization to get ready for these futures and to create these, uh, these futures. And that's, that's really what we want to, to share with you today and what we want to, to work on with you today. So uh, what uh, we would like to do is to embark on a journey to address uh, these uh, future uncertainties with you, uh, to imagine what the post-COVID world could look like, because there will be a post-COVID uh, world, of course, uh, and explore the implication for, for you and, and your business. Uh, and to start this journey, instead of uh, projecting ourselves to the future immediately, uh, what we would like to uh, suggest to you is actually go back in time. Uh, and for those who were already um, attending the uh, G20 Young Entrepreneurs Summit, five years ago, go back in time to the good times we had in Istanbul with Bashak and a team in 2015. So being in 2015, actually the world was still uh, reeling from the uh, Ebola epidemic at the time. Um, how many of you, how many of us would have predicted the global pandemic that we are living today? Uh, and you know, in order to do that, as you know, at Accenture, we like testing new ways of interacting uh, with, uh, with you. Uh, last year, for those who were in, uh, in Japan, you probably remember our uh, Armen was uh, with Marco Tempest. He was making drones fly uh, in the room. Uh, this time around, we're going to do something different. We're going to ask you uh, to answer a few questions on internet. So uh, what we're going to show you right now uh, is an internet address, so menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com. Uh, so please, for those of you who have access to internet for your mobile, for your computer, go to menti.com. Then uh, you will see that you will be asked to type a code, and that code is there on the screen. I hope you can see it now. It's 29846488. Uh, and you will be asked to answer a question. And the question is, did you predict the 2020 global pandemic? So we're going to leave you a few uh, seconds uh, to go on the internet, type the code 29846488, and please answer the question, did you predict at the time the 2020 global pandemic? Okay, I can see how it's, uh, it's uh, evolving. We've got 3% uh, per, per of you for now. Uh, we were at the time uh, had some thoughts that the pandemic could happen. 6%, uh, getting a little bit higher. Few more, few more seconds to see if things are evolving or not. Uh, 
Okay, it's going it's going up to uh, to eight percent, nine percent. Okay, that's that's uh, that's that's interesting. I think we've we've a pandemic. The thing is, uh, when we look back now, uh, we could see that there were signs at the time, right? That there were uh, weak signals. Uh, that uh, some of you uh, apparently uh, uh, were listening to, um, and therefore were uh, able what was going to, to happen. Um, so tomorrow, I think we are going to be able to, to stop uh, this one. So at 12%, thank you. So we can see that uh, a minority, but still 12% uh, were uh, at the time anticipating that uh, something like the, the global pandemic would, would happen. Uh, Insight is a fascinating thing. It's, uh, it's very difficult to unexperience a major event. And uh, um, we've got some bias that we've got to uh, be uh, aware of because these bias may blur uh, the way we can analyze the present and the way we can therefore anticipate the future. Um, I will not list all of these bias, but just to have a few in mind, the optimism bias, it's a rather common one for lots of us, which is to overestimate the rosiness of a, of a future. It confines our imaginations to our comfort zone. Another uh, type of bias is the normalcy bias. It's a, it's a coping mechanism, psychologically speaking. It prevents us from reacting sufficiently to, to new events. And even though we know an event with, is going to affect us, we don't push ourselves beyond what we are used to. And we can see that happening to, to some of us uh, uh, right now. But here is the thing, disruptive events raise new questions and uncertainties. Like, is it a one-off event or is it going to be a new reality? Um, will the impacts be global or will the impacts be mostly local? Uh, how, the, how will this event affect over trends and uncertainty? So in a systemic, in a systemic way. And so that, that's why when you see all these uh, questions, the way we address them uh, is by uh, uh, building scenarios. Uh, and I'm sure many of you have um, been building scenarios uh, in your life. Uh, scenarios are a tool which is uh, very useful when the world is not evolving in a linear way. And that's typically what is happening today. We can see that linear trends are gone. Uh, we are living for a period where there are many disruptions, pandemic being one, of course. Uh, and, and we wanted to start with this one because it's this one that we are living through today. But think about as well what, what happened in the US and beyond. Uh, since the, the death of George Floyd in, in May 2020. Uh, and, and this type of events connected to social unrest, racism, and the like, uh, have got as well a deep impact in society in, in many countries. Uh, and, and again, we could add, of course, climate change um, and uh, some geopolitical uh, events there. So scenarios for that are a, a useful tool to address what could be the potential futures. Now, I want just to stop uh, two minutes on what scenarios are and what they are not. Uh, and you will see that in, uh, in the next slide. Scenarios can help us to um, protect us against groupthink. They provide a, a safe space for creative thinkers to explore and questions. That's the first point, which is very important when we work together in a, in a group, in a company, or in, a, in an organization. They help us to challenge convention, conventional wisdom, allow us to throw away status quo and assumption and imagine alternative futures. And, and obviously, that's something which is much needed uh, uh, right now. They help uh, stakeholders quickly grasp the future. Uh, and to me, that's a fundamental dimension that we work on a lot when we work with large organizations, because scenarios are not there just for a small team to think creatively about what the futures might be. They're there for all the stakeholders to actually co-own what the future could be and how an organization, a company, an administration can actually react, adapt, and, and, and plan for, for the future. Um, they can help to stress test strategies as well. 
this is extremely important nowadays uh, as uh, we've got uh, uh, new tools, I will come back to that in, in a second, that can help us to uh, uh, pilot, test, regroup, retest a lot faster than, than we could 25 years ago or even a decade ago. Uh, and uh, last but not least, uh, they uh, help to enable agile uh, decision making. And, and that's something which for you is, is by essence, being entrepreneurs, agile decision making is, is part of, of you. Uh, when we work with large organization, agile decision making is, is quite often a dimension that we have to uh, uh, preempt and address in a proper manner in order to help organization to be equipped to react and pivot at speed and, and at scale. So these are, are things that scenarios can, can help to, to do or, or to avoid. Uh, equally important is to have in mind what scenarios are not. Uh, and I just want to stop here just one second uh, because it's a way to avoid misunderstanding. Sometimes people um, expect that scenarios are going to predict the future. And again, it's not about predicting the future. So scenarios are not going to be precise or, or detailed in order to elaborate prescriptive plans. They're not going to be immutable because they change over time uh, as new evidences emerges. And they're not going to be un unilateral uh, because different scenarios will develop in, in different markets. And I think it's, it's extremely important to understand that as we live in a world which is not linear, um, and we live in a world where, as I was mentioning, contrary to 25 years ago, contrary to a decade ago, we've got a whole um, series of data. We've got access nowadays to um, data lakes, to data which are produced and can be used in real time, which was not the case even a few years ago. And that's going to help us a lot in order not only to build scenarios, but actually to see the impact in real life of actions that can be taken to adapt to one scenario or another and to assess whether one scenario or another is gaining in plausibility or is not gaining in plausibility. And that's a new way that we're using scenarios these days. It's a lot more agile, a lot more flexible, a lot more adaptable than we used to do it just, uh, just a few years ago. So that's, uh, that's what we're going to, to do with you in this, uh, in this session. Um, and uh, we think it, it connects with the way you act yourself as entrepreneurs. Uh, and that's what we're going to, to dive into now. So uh, I'm going to pass on to, uh, to Armen to take the wheel, guide us along the journey. Uh, and Armen, tell us what the future might look like. Over to you, Armen. Thank you very much, Francis. And hello, entrepreneurs. It's a pleasure to see so many of the familiar names again. I wish I could see all your faces. Um, but as Francis has made clear, and as we saw actually with your Mentimeter input, we probably could have predicted that one day we'd have to run a session like this rather than meet in person. Uh, and here we are trying to figure out what other uncertainties lie ahead, right? And let's do precisely that. Let's think about the biggest uncertainties on our minds, okay? I want you to think about how the world may continue to evolve and how it will affect you and your business, okay? Think about how your customers might change their behaviors, right? Think about how governments might change their policies and their incentives towards entrepreneurs. Think about your workforce, their behaviors, the culture that you have among the workforce. Think about how the pandemic and how a potential vaccine might develop. Okay, in short, I want you to think through the major uncertainties on your mind that will affect you and your business over the coming five years. Now, I'm actually just going to be quiet for a few seconds while you, while you do that. I want you to imagine that far ahead, the post-COVID phase, and what you think the uncertainties are that really are on your mind. There's a lot to be uncertain about right now, isn't there? When we do 
exercises like this and, and Francis mentioned the, the kind of scenario planning that we do with, with our clients, etc. It's always fascinating to see kind of the range of thoughts that people have, the, the concerns. And actually what I find even more effective is when you see or hear the thoughts of others and that sparks more of your own ideas. And, and we're going to try to do some of that uh, in, in a moment. And to be honest, this is a fun part of our jobs. You know, Francis and I get to, in our research team, we get to scan the horizon. We get to act kind of like a radar, looking for uncertainties, looking for trends and signals. Um, and the more people you involve, the better the results, right? And the more diverse the inputs, the more thought provoking the output eventually becomes. And when we did a kind of scanning exercise to plan for this session, we realized that the many uncertainties about the post-COVID world can broadly be categorized into a number of kind of logical spheres, okay? Um, so ultimately they can be attributed to how we live, to how we consume, to how we work, how we govern, and how we manage this pandemic as well as other future shocks, right? As Francis said, this is just the current crisis, but there will be further shocks. So we settled upon these five spheres uh, that you can see on the slide here. And within each sphere, we were able to kind of dig deeper into the specific uncertainties and trends within that. So for example, when you think about how we live, we have uncertainties like, you know, to what extent will we be interacting physically versus virtually? Uh, will we remain more health conscious as a result of the pandemic? Many of us have become more health conscious. Um, after the lockdown experience, will city planning seriously transform, right? We've seen uh, cleaner air, less pollution, more cycling, all these things. Will that mean a transformation in urban environments? So obviously being a, a research-based organization, we can't only rely on our kind of feelings and, and instincts. We're driven very much by the data and the evidence to support those signals and, and, and trends on the horizon. So for example, when we're examining changes in people's decisions about how and where to live, it's important to note that, for example, 17% uh, of Parisians left the city in response to the lockdown. Now, Francis says he didn't, but it's hard to tell when somebody, you know, where you really are when, uh, when you have a webcam, but that's a different matter. In New York, another example is that searches for properties in the suburbs shot up by 250%. Right. So when we're doing these exercises, we look at hundreds of trends and signals and we talk to experts and researchers around the world. And we gather all this evidence so you can imagine you can quickly build up a very complex map of uncertainties and trends across these kind of spheres. So those are the uncertainties. So let's dig a little deeper and think about how those uncertainties might actually play out. So let's use the sphere how we consume from our uh, model to, to do this. Uh, and specifically within how we consume, let's look at a trend within that, which is the trend away from conspicuous consumption and towards more conscious consumption. So what do we mean by that? We mean that people are more consciously thinking about what they're buying, why they're buying it, and the impact that the purchases have, uh, for example, on the environment or on society. Right? So let's look at the data. For example, 56% uh, of respondents to a global consumer survey we did um, say they're buying more locally sourced products since COVID. Right? And 84% of those say they plan to continue doing so into the long term. So you're talking about real long term fundamental shifts in the way people behave. Um, retailers, they've also seen massive growth in customer demand for sustainable practices since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and our surveys also show a massive increase in households around the world trying to limit the food waste since the pandemic. Uh, we also see growing interest in green household investments. So energy efficient products, uh, electric vehicles, local energy equipment like um, uh, solar panels or green energy tariffs, that kind of thing. So as consumers in much of the world, we've become more conscious about our consumption during COVID. The question is, will that last, right? Will it last? How much after COVID will that last? So let's think through this. First, I think it's important to, to recognize that we can see major differences across countries, even from the starting point, right? So you think of China, for example, their, their massive economic growth over recent decades has brought 
you know, millions of people that didn't have disposable income suddenly have disposable income. And that led to serious conspicuous consumption. You know, people wanted to show visible signs of their new status, so lots of luxury goods, etc. You add to that the fact that China, like many Asian countries, has emerged relatively well from the pandemic so far. And you can see that the, the pressure, therefore, towards conscious consumption stimulated by COVID may be weaker there compared to other uh, markets, or at least slower to emerge. Uh, you contrast that with Europe, um, where it's a very different story, right? That already started out placing great importance on conscious consumption, again, relative to other countries. And that really has accelerated during the lockdown. So a lot of our evidence and surveys and data show uh, a real change in, in, in Europe. And now we're entering a new phase, right? We're entering a new phase of the pandemic. Cases are rising again, more restrictions, more lockdown. And we'll see whether those trends maybe get embedded further. Will they get ingrained even more? Or perhaps we'll see a kind of backlash. So that's what we do with these uncertainties and trends, right? We try to imagine the different directions they might move in. Uh, and again, the more data that you have from different parts of the world, the, the better your perspective. Now, let me introduce a new lens. We've been talking about behavioral change, right? Um, with consumers, it's very obvious. But when you talk about behavioral change, it's not always about individuals, right, like consumers, it's often the systems, right, the systems behavior also changes. That might be because of government policy, you know, government systems, it might be healthcare systems or business practices, business norms, all these things can change. And the behavior of these systems and the behavior of individuals are connected and they do actually influence one another. So again, going back to the example of consumption in China, um, the massive growth there led to very high pollution levels, right? But the high pollution levels meant that there are a lot of government incentives to make the economy cleaner and greener, right? So China is the, the most prolific producer of wind energy. In fact, it's more than twice the second uh, generator, which is the US. Um, it's also the leader on solar. They've got about a third of the world's solar generation capacity, right? And they built more systems last year than any other country. So the Chinese government is putting its full force behind this move. You know, they've pledged to become carbon neutral by 2060, which is extraordinary when you consider where the country is right now. And those systemic incentives really can spur companies and entrepreneurs to innovate and have new green offerings. And in turn, that drives more innovation and advances the green economy. And all that drives yet further conscious consumption. So a kind of virtuous cycle gets established between the individual behaviors and the systemic behaviors. But what if that's not how things play out in the future? What if individuals and systems don't kind of sync up in that way and reinforce each other and create virtuous cycles. What if, what if is the fundamental question that drives scenario analysis? And what we've done in this session so far is we've just introduced the building blocks to construct those what if scenarios. Okay, so we've, we've covered the five spheres, the critical uncertainties, uh, the distinction between individuals and systems. These are our kind of building blocks and we're gonna use those to construct our scenarios. How do we do that? Well, it's quite simple. We actually plot those what if questions on a chart and you can see the chart here on the slide. The X axis shows our individual behaviors. So you move towards the left. It's more about returning back to behaviors of the past before the pandemic. You move to the right. It's about accelerating change beyond the pandemic. Uh, so for example, towards more conscious consumption. You look at the vertical Y axis. Uh, this axis represents changing behaviors of systems, right? Governments, corporations, institutions, that kind of thing. Uh, so lower down, we move back to futures where the systems return to pre-pandemic behaviors. Moving up, it's the, the, the governments, the, the, the systems are reinventing themselves. They're taking on new behaviors. So for example, states that upgraded their social protection systems during the pandemic, they would continue to offer more supportive protection uh, systems. All right, so that's the framework. Um, what we're going to do now is actually uh, talk about the scenarios. We've got all the, we're going to open our minds to do that. And I'll need Francis's help to help uh, to help me with that. Um, we're going to share them out. We're going to do a couple each, uh, but partly because my voice is getting dry, but mainly because you're probably all bored from hearing my voice. Let's get a romantic French accent to guide us through the first scenario. So Francis, take it away.
Thank, thank you, Armin. Um, I'm actually in Paris as a, as a true Parisian, Armin, to avoid any misunderstanding. So uh, let, let's, uh, let's first uh, focus on the first scenario that uh, we call uh, collective change. Uh, and uh, I want here to, to thank our colleague uh, Omaro Mazali, who's been really the driving force to define this scenario. So if you think about this one, um, a few hypotheses to define this, this scenario. Um, first of all, the, the resolution to the crisis is not as quick as uh, people would have hoped. Uh, safety issues with the early vaccines push distribution to 2022. Uh, but governments maintain a balancing act between limiting economic harm and keeping citizens safe. They invest in technological, health, and environmental systems so that social cohesion grows uh, in, this, uh, in this scenario. The economic recovery is, is, is slow to start because of what I was mentioning in terms of, of vaccine, but the government stimulus programs ultimately bear fruit. So you have to think in these scenarios that behavioral changes are going to, to last. Uh, one of the, uh, of the way we characterize that when, when we talk to clients is that every business is a health business. So the, the health dimension uh, has a long lasting impact uh, in behavioral changes and in the way businesses uh, develop their, their activities. Most of our life um, will remain online in these scenarios. So virtual habits become the norm uh, and the growth of e-commerce continue at a sustained pace. So if I had to summarize uh, this one with two words, uh, it would be around stakeholder capitalism becoming the norm. So stakeholder capitalism, Things of, think of these scenarios where uh, both individual and systemic behaviors change dramatically as, as a result of a pandemic. So there is a consensus growing for collective transformation. Now that's the, the structure of a scenario. What we would like you to do now is to imagine what will happen to your business in this collective change scenario. Think of your strategy, think of your brand customers, your workforce, your, your operation. And we invite you to uh, uh, contribute your thoughts uh, through a word cloud. So it's the same system that you've been using um, initially. So please, if you can go now to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com, use the same um, number, 29846488. I repeat, 29846488, and answer the question about how would that scenario impact your, your business? Thank you. I can see flexibility, adaptation, opportunity. People management. Open mind build. Adapt. Growth. Okay. Resilience. Innovation. Digitalization. People management. Yeah. Okay, well, thank, thank you a lot for, for this one. Uh, we're going to, uh, to move uh, in a second to uh, the next scenario with you, Armin. 
Thank you very much, Francis. And guys, that we we will actually be coming back to those word clouds once we've gone through all the scenarios so that um, we can compare them. So we'll we'll come back to those at that one in a moment. So as Francis said, let's move on to the second scenario. This one is called System Crash, and it imagines a world where individuals have been inspired to change their behaviors by the pandemic, but these demands by citizens are not matched by systemic changes, okay? So that can lead to frustration. So under system crash, ineffective public health interventions lead to uncontrolled transmission of the virus well into 2021, especially during the winter in the Northern hemisphere. A vaccine is eventually found, but the global geopolitical landscape continues to fragment. There's no cooperative approach to battle the pandemic. The global economy is nudged deeper into the dark. Individuals are deeply impacted by the experience of the pandemic. They're frustrated with the continued failure of uh, the technologies and from the central systems to battle uh, uh, the respond to their desire for change. So they seek to drive change from the bottom up. So in the absence of government investment, communities form collectives to provide services at the local level. The global monopolies of the platform economy are increasingly challenged as people focus on buying locally produced sustainable goods and services. So large global online retailers dissolve into separate local in in entities and they're less dependent on global production chains. The failure of technology to handle the pandemic, the fatigue of kind of digital overload during the extended confinement breeds a kind of tech clash. People try to minimize the invasion of technology in their lives. And as the economic picture darkens, you get less of the purpose-driven business, the, the stakeholder capitalism that Francis was talking about. By 2025, there's a bit of hope, which comes, it's driven by a new generation of politicians and entrepreneurs determined to generate systemic change. But by 25, by 2025, things are tough. So that's system crash. So again, I'd like you to Think about your business in the world of system crash. Think again about your strategy, your brand, your customers, your workforce, your operations, the different aspects of your business, and think what will the implications be. And again, let's go back to Mentimeter to use as the place to communicate your feelings towards this. Which parts of your business will be most affected? How, what are the implications of system crash? And a very important point as you continue to give your input, if you see something on the screen in the word cloud that you agree with, please submit it again yourself. You can put as many as you want. You can submit as many things as you want. The more you see something that you agree with and it's reinforced, we understand then that that is an important thing for the collective group and it will get bigger and bigger. So we're seeing risk getting bigger and bigger. Interesting, we see risk and opportunity, um, like true entrepreneurs. Uh, alternatives, choices, options. Catastrophic, chaos, we would close. Consumers, supply chain. Lots of different parts of the business being person to person. That's a very important. I've seen a lot of different things related to people, person, personal rapport, again, personal connection. So again, if you see something you like, please continue. And in the meantime, we will slowly move our way towards the third scenario. So I can see you're all still working on those. So 
I'll hand over to Francis for the third scenario. Okay, thank you, Armin. F third scenario is uh, the easiest one to, uh, to, to, to understand and to, to own. It's back to business. Uh, and when we say back to business, it means that uh, there are uh, effective vaccines bringing a quick end uh, to, to the pandemic. Um, the recovery packages uh, from uh, governments are toned down and government uh, focus on rebalancing their, their books and, and reducing uh, their level of, of public debts. The incentive to, to change are limited. There is a general sense of let's go back to, to business as quickly as possible. Uh, and most individuals and systems revert to the past patterns that we have seen uh, prior to, to the pandemic. So think of entertainment venues, for instance, where people gather again. Uh, think of uh, uh, borders reopening, trade, travel, vacation, resuming as, as they were before. Um, office desk as well, uh, coming back again in, in fashion and as most people go back to, to their offices. Um, and think about uh, uh, in-person commerce and retail experiences uh, being very much in, in demand. So, so that's really the, the scenario that uh, uh, we like you uh, to think about. And of course, in this back to business scenario, uh, we'll have a, a G20 Young Entrepreneur Summit next year in Italy, all together in the same room again to uh, uh, celebrate the fact that we are back to business. So now that you uh, understand what it is about, we're going to, uh, to ask you again to uh, um, go to menti.com uh, using the same uh, number and uh, uh, tell us what you think it would mean uh, for your business in this scenario. can see growth, globalization, competition. Of course, there is an, an, an growth. It's, in, it's interesting. Uh, I can see growth sales, uh, rapid rebound. Uh, there is another side of this scenario that I did not mention so much, but that you can uh, quickly think about, of course, is the uh, the, the polarization, the inequalities that we have seen uh, before the pandemic becoming even uh, uh, bigger in that, uh, in that scenario. <laughs> Opportunity to change, growth, innovation. So I think I've been selling this scenario, I mean, uh, quite quite well. So uh, we'll see if you can sell now the, uh, the fourth scenario. Over to you. Thank you very much, Francis. I don't know if I'm trying to sell. I have noticed that I get the more, the scenarios that are more about upheaval <laughs> rather than the, so, but it is also, by the way, when we come back, I can see that the, even though this was a positive tone, things like growth, uh, success, etc. It's a different tone from the first one uh, about collective, which actually had more almost forward-looking stuff like flexibility, adaptability, uh, innovation, resilience. But we'll we'll come back to that. It's very interesting. So let's finish with our fourth and final scenario. It's called Big Society, and this one imagines a world where the leaders of uh, government, corporations, institutions, civil society, they drive this systemic change in response to the pandemic, but individuals may not fully feel ready for these changes. So let's hear more about that. So in big society, the pandemic continues well into 2021. National governments realize that unilateral responses are failing. 
this leads to a more coordinated multinational effort to suppress the outbreak. So the G20 coordinates with drug companies to distribute a vaccine, ensuring that everyone in the world is vaccinated without charge. So governments, institutions and business continue to work together to address the issues highlighted by the pandemic. So the, the direction, the depth and pace of change though is too much for some citizens, right? Things are moving too fast and that leads to social tensions and unrest in some countries and some communities. So, you know, governments have had a, a radical rethink of how healthcare, housing, transport and other services are provided. So for example, electric vehicles, all those targets have been brought, brought forward earlier. Older generations that are less comfortable with the technologies that really sit at the heart of a lot of these systemic changes, they feel excluded, right? They're, they're less able to work with these technologies. The regulations aimed at mitigating the impact of uh, products and services on the environment and human health increase, but so do also the requirements for traceability of products to, this, to their source. So all these technology-based kind of regulations and, and rules um, really help to make things safer. That's great on one hand, but you also have the reaction to that as people react to the technologies and also the kind of all seeing uh, government. So um, companies collaborate with uh, uh, to help employees uh, to retrain, flexible working becomes the norm, but employees grow more concerned about the use of intrusive surveillance technology, right? Lots of uh, employee led activist movements rise and they are quashed through company monitoring uh, uh, of worker communications, right? So governments introduce, for example, app-based health monitoring, right? That's great for curtailing uh, potential epidemics, but then public concern grows about the increasing invasion of privacy from the health monitoring, right? People know more about our very personal uh, details that a lot of people aren't comfortable about. So the return to economic growth is bumpy and takes time and social tensions flare up intermittently, but the extent of national investment and the removal of things like trade barriers, et cetera, lay the foundations for longer term, more equitable kind of growth. So that's the fourth scenario called big society. So as with the others, let's um, think about the implications for you, your business, think of your strategy, think of your brand, think of your customers, your workforce, your operations. It's mentimeter.com again. The same site, the same code. And again, a reminder, when the word cloud is building and you see something that you agree with, please do repeat it yourself so that we get the sense of what people agree with. Conspiracy theories here. Higher taxes, increased costs, co-creation, new products. So you're getting a, it's a very interesting dual perspective here of benefits and challenges of this scenario, which to me always feels realistic of the world, right? Globalization. Interesting, the word globalization. It's, a, it's neutral when you see it on its own but people will interpret it in different ways depending on their perspective. Surveillance, surveillance state is staying huge, growth. Jeff keeps finding his way in. Adaptation, that's another one that keeps coming up. We've seen adaptation, I'd say in all of them so far. Growth, okay, we will, as I said, we'll come back to these in just a moment. I'm just gonna give a bit more time to let those grow, that one grow. All right, so we are in a moment, like I said, gonna quickly remind ourselves of the four scenario word clouds. But before we do that, actually, I have a very simple question uh, and probably the obvious one. Which of these four scenarios do you think is actually most likely to actually play out in your country, right? And as we said, things are very different in different countries. We've, we've already talked about some of those differences. So is it collective change as a reminder, which is where individuals and society leap forward together? 
is it system crash where systems stagnate and citizens push forward? Is it back to business where systems and individuals revert back to the former status quo? Or is it big society where systems try to push change, but with some resistance from society? So let's see your votes coming into there. So this is what you think will happen. This is not necessarily what you would like to happen, which may be something else. Please don't let that cloud your judgment too much. So let's see how this is going. At the moment we have 40% in big society. We have 20% in each of the others. Interestingly there, as far as I can see, they're pretty even with, apart from big society jumping ahead. Although I think perhaps this is because there's been a a small technical glitch, but I think that's fine. Um, so I think the the screen has frozen, but we'll we'll come back to that in a moment. So if I think back, and hopefully we'll get a chance to look at those word clouds. Oh, here it's moving again. Oh, back to business is growing fast with thirty percent collective change, forty two percent, forty four percent. So that it's interesting. So the two more positive or benign scenarios that Francis talked about are the ones that, that you're all uh, voting for, which suggests optimism, right, uh, for a start. Um, secondly, I would say collective change is the greater long-term optimistic one, right? That's the one where everyone looks for a better future uh, and moves together towards that future, whereas back to business is perhaps good in ways that we're comfortable with, that we know about, um, which have some downsides as well. Um, in the meantime, big society is creeping up, but it's still clear that those two really are the ones that, that, that again, typical of uh, optimistic view. So let's uh, have a very, very quick uh, look, Omar, if it's possible, at the um, word cloud. So I did notice things like adaptation. Uh, if you go to each of the word clouds, let's have a very quick look at them. Um, I saw topics around people. Uh, across all of them, I saw innovation, change, agility, adaptation, collective change. Um, some of them had more about these ideas about uh, the, the employees and your, your people. Um, that was a very interesting kind of thing. So you have here employee morale, uh, people. Um, it, it, it came out in many different ways, personal relationships that came out, etc. So that was very interesting to see. And um, we'll see, see that in the broader discussions. Now let's let's think about that because this is going to lead me to uh, another question. And I, I was specifically looking there for kind of cross-cutting themes, similarities that, that pop up across different word clouds. Now think about what that means. It means that you would consistently prioritize those parts of your business, right, in different scenarios. So whatever happens in the future, those things that you see that consistently crop up you know that those are things that you want to invest in, right? We call those no regret investment because however the future unfolds, the investment will pay off, right? So let's consider what areas might be suitable for you to look for no regret investments in your business. So think about all four of those scenarios. Look at the notes that you took. Um, think of those five areas that we've been examining, your strategy, your brand, your customers, your workforce, your operations, Right, a lot of the words you wrote in the word cloud relate to one uh, or more of those. So actually, we'll we'll let you choose two. Um, so Mentimeter will let you choose your two top priorities of where you would invest in order to kind of get those no regret investments. However, the future turns out. So we can see strategy growing. Strategy staying up there. Customers moving up. So strategy staying up there. And make sense of so thinking about the future, planning for the future, uh, strategic planning. It's something that people 
really don't do enough of right in a in a full scenario analysis kind of workshop this is the stage we would really dig into your specific business right we've gone through the imaginative creative part of the exercise that's where you translate now to potential futures into real business decisions today and imagining what seem like extreme scenarios is a very helpful way to bring a focus onto what's really most important to you and to your business. So you know, we often think about what's a high probability and a very high impact. Let's focus on that. And, and all this is exactly as you guys have said through this chart. It's about building your strategy and your plan for resilience. Okay, so thank you so much entrepreneurs for joining in this activity. I hope uh, that's been helpful. The session isn't over, but what we are going to move to now is our final part. What we've gone through, if you think about it, it's, it's a stimulating kind of examination of what might happen in the future and how we might best prepare for those different kinds of futures. But how are people already preparing? Now, let's find out. Um, and the way we're going to do that is to talk to people who have done actually an incredible job of already preparing for different futures. Uh, we're delighted to have with, uh, a number of uh, the young entrepreneurs join us now um, in a panel session. So we're going to hear about how the pandemic is actually shaping their future and how it has been. So I'd like to welcome our panelists. Um, we have Dun Zhao, the co-founder of 17 EdTech. We have Louis Debuzi, the founder and CEO of uh, Amabilis. We have Noura al Shubaili, founder of Bazira Community, uh, who's an emotional resilience coach. We have Kitty Liao, who's the founder and CEO of Ideabatic. And we have Michele Frizzoli, CEO of the Manta Group. Welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for joining. Um, so we've been through four scenarios of how the future could play out. Of course, we could create many more, but scenarios have to be based in, uh, in reality, right? So we need to kind of listen and learn um, uh, to, from real experiences, right, of what's actually shaping things on the ground, right? And you'll see that our panelists, their backgrounds are from very different backgrounds. They have very different stories to tell. Uh, their businesses are very diverse. So we're going to delve deeper into each of those angles as we talk to each of them. So Dun Zhao, if it's okay, I would love to start with you. Um, let me just check that your microphone is working. Can we hear you? Can you hear us, Dun Zhao? I know we could hear you at the beginning. Dun Zhao, can you hear us? If you could unmute your Computer. Let's uh, maybe we'll we'll move back to Dunjiao in a moment. Uh, perhaps Louis, are you there? Let's start with Louis. Yes. Fantastic, Louis. Let's let's turn to you. So, one of the kind of silver linings of the pandemic is um, the new spotlight on the care industry. Right. We've really understood how important uh, health. Uh, is and it's a sector that's sadly been overlooked right in many economic systems around the world uh, now i guess it's a testament to your entrepreneurial spirit that when you felt the impact of the pandemic you didn't just raise the game of your existing business right you created something entirely new and disruptive so please tell us about that journey and about how you see the uh, the care industry evolving in the future yes of course uh, first, thank you so much. I'm so I'm so glad to be to be here. So not physically, but uh, it's uh, it's so it's so great. So yes. So basically, we have two activities. Um, we do home care giving. So we hire nurses and caregivers for people with disabilities or aged people. Um, and we have a second activity. Uh, we sell medical equipment. During the crisis, uh, the second activity, so uh, the selling of uh, medical equipment, uh, totally uh, dropped down. Uh, for one simple reason, uh, most of our patients or clients, uh, they didn't want anymore uh, to be in touch with the technician guy or woman, uh, because when you need uh, to buy a new medical equipment, you need to try it out. And then you need to be, um, it needs to be set up. And of course, um, for now, it's still set, set up by, um, by a human. 
And so the activity totally dropped down. So uh, we have decided to start a new business, like totally new. Uh, before, so we were uh, working for an uh, individual. So it was a B2C business. And so we have decided to start a totally new business and to build a marketplace uh, which connects uh, manufacturers and uh, professionals from the health uh, field. So uh, we have created Hello Medical, uh, which connects brands and manufacturers with dentists, with physical therapists, with doctors, in order to buy their uh, equipment. Very interesting. So you've actually decided to go into disrupting an entirely new market. Yes. Um, was that an obvious decision or did it take, was it a difficult journey to get to that point? No, it was like, uh, I don't know, maybe two or three months. We, we saw that uh, the activity was, let's say like, I don't know, maybe 80, 90 percent down. And we say, OK, we will try something new. Uh, it's it's working um, and uh, I'm very excited because it's a, it's a way new uh, business um, and uh, of course it's uh, uh, we've we thought about it for like maybe two or three months um, for now we didn't decide to stop you know uh, the first um, activity well, which was selling medical equipment to individuals but that said that all of our patients, uh, they've decided to, you know, to delay or to cancel their buying of uh, uh, medical equipment. Very cool. Very cool. So that's a great example of what we call kind of jumping the S curve. You're, you're still in your business and then you're already building your next one, innovating the next, uh, the next uh, strategic growth area. Very, um, very interesting and interesting to connect that to Dun Xiao if we can hear uh, Dun Xiao, can you hear us now? I can see that you've gone, you have unmuted yourself, but for some reason we can't hear you. Um, so we'll come back to you. Yeah, we'll come back to you uh, in a moment. Hopefully you can uh, fix that. Perhaps you leave and rejoin or something like that. In the meantime, let's let's turn to, um, to Kitty, Kitty Diao. Now your business, uh, Kitty, let's just check that we can hear you. <laughs> Hello. Excellent. Nice to see you, Kitty. So your business is directly involved in the pandemic space, right? So I'll let you describe it because I don't want to get it wrong. I'm not a multi-award winning former CERN physicist like you are, so I probably would get it wrong. Uh, but as well as hearing about your pandemic response, I'm very interested in your view of our preparedness for future crises, right? You've seen what's worked and what hasn't worked. It would be great to hear your view of your confidence for our reaction to the next crisis, the next pandemic. So Kitty, please. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I spent more than 10 years working with systems in very cold environment. And so I founded Ideabatic, inspired by a humanitarian hackathon I participated uh, in 2014 at CERN, where I used to work as a physicist and engineer to upgrade the Large Hadron Collider. So in that event, I was really shocked to hear that 20 million children still not receiving any basic vaccinations and every year between two and three million children die of a vaccine preventable disease. And this is largely because the cold chain issues happening in the last mile of the vaccine delivery in these developing countries. So with my background, I thought there must be a way to solve this. So we Ideabatic would develop Smile, a smart last mile vaccine carrier to cover that journey from a few hours to seven days, which currently is, is just not possible. And Smile lasts for 14 times longer than existing, the kind of like the cool box style products. And it has a fail safe design to eliminate that vaccine spoilage caused by human errors, which is a huge, huge problem. And for us, the product has been iterated, tested and field proven. So we're now fundraising for production and we're so keen to be involved in countrywide planning for vaccine cold chain. And so because of this COVID situation, we were unable to visit our potential users and manufacturing partners abroad. 
Um, so in a way, this kind of makes our life easier. So to reconcentrate on sourcing manufacturers, uh, manufacturers locally in Britain, where we can travel relatively easily. And this would allow us to have more control over the whole process to reduce the risks in, in product delivery. And so the situation of COVID also opens up opportunities for us, which means that we could help with mass vaccination and testing, especially when reaching out to vulnerable populations for the whole world. And, and luckily we also won a, a pandemic grant funding from the Royal Academy of Engineering. So that's always a good thing. And, and at the moment we're working with a logistics company just to talk about kind of like potential uh, plans going forward. Um, having said that, um, we started speaking to decision makers in, in NHS England, Scotland and in the cabinet at the beginning of the pandemic and during the pandemic, but there was just no response on, on how and whether there's any plan delivering vaccines to 67 million people in the UK, especially for those who can't get to vaccination points easily. And some of these people in the higher up positions, they just think there won't be any problems at all, even though a lot of these vaccines would require a second booster to really um, increase the, the herd immunity. So we feel that the UK still hasn't learned from that. Um, the PPE panic and then the, the poor response and planning. And looking at countries like Taiwan or South Africa, uh, sorry, South Korea, um, so in, from Taiwan, they have learned from the SARS pandemic and were able to react so quickly in the first place. And, and they have continued to do so well to minimize deaths and economy risks. And so far, there have been only seven deaths across Taiwan, which has a population of 24 million people. And if we were to look at the um, economy growth since COVID in the first five months, UK decreased by 15%, China down by 70, uh, sorry, 7.7%, Japan down by 8.4%, and Taiwan maintain a positive growth of 1.5%. So yes, UK, come on, we just need to get together and stop all this nonsense. And, and for us, Idea about it, we'd be more than delighted to help involve in, in coaching and logistics planning. And if you know any decision makers in your country, we'd be more than happy to to help. Fantastic. Thank you, Kitty. I mean, you know, when we're talking about these scenarios and trying to figure out what's going to happen, I feel like of everyone here and on this call and listening, you are probably the person most able to actually shape what happens next uh, through your vaccine distribution system. So thank you very much for that. <laughs> We're still trying, so yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, Dun Zhao, I can see that you're back. Let's just test your voice now. Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me now? We can, fantastic. So Dun Zhao, let me turn to you. So, you know, we've heard a few different stories here. Now you're an example of a firm that was already booming and then just accelerated even more. I mean, your firm has been valued at $3 billion, if I'm not uh, mistaken. And you sit at that fascinating intersection between education and technology, right? And both of those are booming. Um, and technology obviously saved absolute disaster during the lockdowns through allowing digital learning, homeworking, et cetera but it's also shone a light on the dangerous gaps between those who have access to digital learning and those who don't. Um, and I think that's important. So please tell us a bit about how you responded to the pandemic and how you think this experience will shape both your company and the global education industry. Well, thank you, Amon, for, um, for your question. It's an honor to, uh, uh, to meet everyone and share here. Uh, so we are an ad tech company based in China, and we focus uh, mainly on K-12 education for kids uh, from age 6 to 18. And to date, we have uh, over 100 million registered uh, users uh, studying on our platform, uh, with uh, every day over uh, 20 million students studying on our platform. Uh, we've been doing this, uh, focusing on uh, using technology to um, promote both the fair access and uh, more efficient education for the last nine years. Uh, and as uh, Amin mentioned, it's been booming, but it's never been growing uh, exponentially. I, I think it's a little bit unfortunate that uh, we had to have this crisis to uh, 
enter the era of digital learning. Uh, I think 2020 is actually the first year of actual digital learning, uh, but I think it is uh, fortunate that we are here. Um, we, from about uh, 10 months ago, from January, when uh, we first found out there was this uh, uh, virus uh, breakout in Wuhan, in China, uh, we have been working very, very hard to meet the demand of uh, various users, teachers, uh, students, parents, schools, um, lots of uh, schools and uh, even local governments come to us uh, for solutions because schools have closed. Uh, parents are very agonizing over how the, their kids can, can learn and grow. Um, and we had uh, unprecedented demand. Uh, we even had demand from uh, outside China, uh, which were not uh, areas where we used to do business before. Uh, for instance, the Ministry of Education in Singapore recently approached us uh, for uh, education informationization, uh, total solution, an upgrade to their student learning platform. Uh, I think this um, crisis um, will have a profound Im impact on how we learn. I think children, the next generation, uh, they already grow in an environment that is both um, physical and digital. It's a blended environment. Uh, I think it's a little bit slow for uh, us adults to catch up on this, uh, but it's, it's a fact. It's, it's, a, it's their reality that they have grown up with these uh, digital content and, and, and even friends. Um, so I think you know, your, your learning experience your, is your whole life ex experience. Uh, so I think uh, learning is definitely going to be blended in the future. Uh, so uh, be it an offline school or an offline uh, learning center, um, everyone is now thinking about uh, digitization uh, and all the internet companies are thinking about how we uh, utilize technology such as AI and big data to help uh, uh, everyone learn better and more efficiently. And I also want to thank you for mentioning this uh, digital access gap. I think it's uh, a real problem, um, but it's, it's already somewhat helped by the utilization of technology in education. Um, before we had to ship teachers to you know, remote villages and mountains um, to deliver the best educational uh, resources and the best classes. Uh, but now we can use Zoom uh, instantaneously. Uh, however, there are still people who do not have adequate access to education. And for that, I think the Chinese government actually uh, set a good example. Um, I think to date, um, the uh, mobile internet coverage, mainly 4G, has already covered 98% of the country, including all the villages. And the government has invested heavily on infrastructure earlier this year and coined this term, uh, new infrastructure. So on top of traditional infrastructure that supports the so-called uh, traditional industries, the new, in the, uh, the new infrastructure focuses on essential foundations of the digital economy, including 5G, AI, cloud, data centers, et cetera that facilitates better utilization of information and data. So before, you know, China built lots of roads and railways, and now people can travel. Um, but now China's, uh, Chinese government is investing really heavily on building the so-called information highway so that companies and institutions like ours can build the digital cars and, and trains to travel on those. So uh, for us, uh, you know, knowledge, content, uh, classes can travel freely. And I, I know that all of the people in the world should have access to the digital world. I think it's, a, uh, it's the same as the air or uh, water um, to me, I think for the next generation. And I hope uh, going back to the scenarios you were mentioning, I hope that uh, the governments can work together to go to these scenarios of collective change or big society uh, to solve these fundamental uh, infrastructures together. I, I hope that politics don't get in the way of mm -hmm. such essential investments and we can uh, all provide a foundation for our next generation to be able to uh, learn uh, freely with the best content wherever they are, uh, whatever time they want. Um, and I definitely envision a world where um, learning is um, everywhere for everyone and is uh, almost free. Thank Very you. Good. Thank you very much, Jinjiao. It's very, very interesting. It, when we think of the future, pe people often imagine things being linear or smooth. In real life, there are always step changes, and it feels like 
as you say, this pandemic has been a step change that will will uh, mark a, a shift in the, in the future trajectory of, of these things, especially digital learning. And often those step changes have a big uh, role from government. Uh, so that's that's very interesting. Um, Noura, let's turn to you. Noura, um, Al Shubayli, can you hear us? Let's just check that you can hear us. I can hear you. Can you hear me? We can indeed. Thank, Thank you very you much. much. So you so, are an emotional resilience coach, and I guess you know, demand for your services must be pretty high uh, right now. Um, it'd be very interesting to hear your journey over the past few months for, for you and your organization. You know, has it been, as we said, that kind of slow, uh, steady progress or have there been peaks? What, you know, compare right now to the beginning, it must have been a very interesting kind of journey. But also looking ahead, how do you see that evolving in the future now that there's so much greater awareness everywhere in the world about emotional and mental health issues? Um, yes, absolutely. That's such a great point and such a great question. I believe that for my own business, um, this uh, pandemic has actually been a positive uh, effect for it. Now, more than ever, people are dealing with unprecedented changes. And uh, change by default is very destabilizing to our psychology as humans. Uh, we do not like feeling uncertain. It's not nice. It's not comfortable. We do not know what's lying ahead. And this uncertainty isn't just on an individual level. It's on a government level. It's on a collective level globally. So what I have done with my business is that I've taken it fully online. I've started establishing online communities instead of real life uh, workshops that I used to do. And what that ended up doing is actually enabling further access to my content. So I've had people from all around the Middle East tuning into my workshops that I crafted uh, in a way that addressed the things that came up to people during the pandemic, like fear and anxiety, stress. Um, so it actually made my business even more uh, relevant considering the global context. Um, so that's something I've been doing uh, and that's been working because we even have a high penetration of the internet and smartphones. So it's easy for people to just tune in. So looking at it from that lens, uh, that's how it is for my business. And that's how I see it moving forward. I was uh, pleasantly surprised by how Zoom can be genuine and helpful and maybe not as good as in person, but quite close to it. Very good. Thank you, Nora. It's, it is fascinating to see how everybody has, you know, the, the step change in the conversation about these issues. Uh, again, we felt it happening before the pandemic, but there's been an absolute step change in people being prepared and able to talk about these issues. Uh, and so we need a lot more Nouras to help us uh, in the future. So I'm very happy to, to, to hear that, that it's happening, that this is a, a reality, that, that uh, these services are being provided and that digital methods allow them to be provided at scale um, in this kind of environment. So thank you, Nora. Um, so you can already tell, by the way, people, how different these uh, the, the, all our entrepreneurs are in, in terms of what they do. Michele, who we're going to talk to next, Michele Frizolid. So what I found fascinating about Michele, which will be true for many, many other uh, companies in the, in the YEA, is that you, Michele, your company, the Manta Group, is intimately tied up in international supply chains, right, in aerospace and automotive industries. So, you know, when the crisis broke out, most of the reaction was very national, right? Every country kind of looked inside at itself and they ignored the impact on the really important supply chains that, that we all need. Um, and this especially, you know, travel routes, et cetera, were, were breaking down, let alone the, the, the trade issues. So you saw both, right? You saw the impact on your own manufacturing and the impact across the supply chains with your clients, et cetera. So please tell us about how that played out and what you've learned and how you see that potentially playing out um, in the future, Michele. Absolutely. <clears throat> Thank you, first of all, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, and to share my experience. Uh, yes, we are very different from the companies we saw uh, until now. 
We are a manufacturing business and we work into the aerospace and automotive global supply chains. We are a manufacturer of parts. Uh, we specialize in uh, production of parts and composites and metal. And uh, we produce subasses that then we deliver to our final clients. So uh, we, we deliver the parts and they go to the final assembly line. Uh, now, what uh, we've seen is, that, of course, uh, COVID strongly impacted our business, uh, especially, uh, I mean, first of all, because the volumes strongly decreased. So we've seen uh, a reduction only in March of uh, 50%, and it was not, uh, uh, let me say, the critical month. It was about 43% reduction in aviation and uh, uh, in, uh, in air traffic, and there was a 35% decrease in volume in automotive. Uh, so with this, uh, we started together with the reduction of volumes. Uh, we started to experience a very uh, strong difficulty in uh, procuring the parts because uh, borders started to close. There was a lot of panic around the government. They didn't know how to uh, manage mobility. And Italian government uh, on March 8 was the first government to go on lockdown. So we had the country that was completely shut down. And uh, we, uh, it, it was pretty complicated. Uh, now, at that moment, being part of a global supply chain, of course, we work for companies like Boeing, Mitsubishi, uh, Fiat Chrysler, uh, Leonardo. So we ship 80% of our products uh, across the borders. So they go to US, to Japan. And uh, it's been for us really a logistic uh, challenge. Uh, although I have to say, together with that, uh, in, in a moment like that, a company like ours, you know, you have two options. One is wait and see and uh, see what uh, can happen on the market. And uh, another one is uh, react and try to focus your resources on uh, what you think might be, uh, you know, the, the next move and might generate also a little bit of confidence because uh, we dealt with panic from people, uncertainty and uh, global supply chain disruption. And together with that, we had the financial institutions that were pretty worried about what's gonna be the situation for all the companies involved in global supply chain. Uh, so what we've done, um, we shut down completely our automotive area uh, in, uh, on March 28th, 24th. And uh, at that moment, we moved all the best resources we have in R&D department in a, into a completely new, um, on a completely new challenge. We wanted to exploit our competencies in uh, composites in order to make masks that in that moment it's a it's a very simple product that in that moment were not available and it was a completely different product in terms of uh, specialization for us so we started doing research uh, a week later we came up with the first uh, prototype of mask which was now certified and we started to give it to communities because uh, everyone was uh, fearing this uh, this uh, virus and uh, the spread of it and uh, after a few weeks later we started to procure materials from countries that used to make those materials and countries namely are China and Turkey, but it was impossible because like Turkish government forbid Turkey from exporting materials for masks. And same thing happened to China where there was a, you know, a huge demand coming from all over the world. So that was the moment, the moment when we focused on how can we do it in the country? And so we created a local supply chain, re-adapting uh, uh, materials were produced by Italian companies. And we, we certified our first mask with the Italian uh, Institute of Health. Um, with, uh, it was beginning of May, and then we started supplying masks to the civil protection. This had a huge impact on, uh, I have to say, people's psychology, because like, they started to find a new purpose. And uh, of course, for us, it was an opening of a complete new business. Today, we are part of two technological hubs uh, for all the manufacturers that produce medical devices in Italy. And uh, we uh, created a, a spin-off of our company, which is called Mantamed. And so we are uh, trying to support the country and the civil protection on this topic. Uh, if I have to look at the future uh, uh, based on these experiences, of course, we diversified. In the end, we, uh, we uh, basically, we raised the salaries as a paradox uh, in, a, in an industry where there was in complete crisis and we hired new people uh, due to the new division. But what was the big point uh, at that time was like the motivation of people, how you communicate things in a moment of uncertainty and how you create motivation into people was the real key challenge. It's not about 
uh, not necessarily, I mean, of course, you've got to have technology at the basis. We're a technological company and we make things that must fly or must go on the road, so they must be safe. But in the end, the final, pro the final product is always a product of people approach. Uh, looking at the future, uh, I mean, we were talking about scenarios before in your panel, and uh, I don't know which scenar scenario uh, perfectly fits the situation, but uh, if I have to give my uh, you know, perspective is probably I see global supply chains on one side uh, becoming for fundamental parts that need a lot of movement, a little bit more local. And this, is, this does not mean necessarily something wrong because it would also have a very positive impact on environment. On the other side, I see a widening of uh, global services and uh, the increase of transparency of all those businesses that do not require a lot of movement or that require specializations that specific countries are able to give. So let me say a, a mid ground between uh, the closed economies that we saw probably 80 years ago and uh, the total globalization on everything, looking only at cost. I see a more homogeneous world where rules are the same for everyone and we try to make people catch up. We we're talking about kids that don't have access to education. Like if, uh, if the, the whole world levels up, uh, I think that globalization can reshape its way, its fundamentals, and it would have a very good impact on us. Very good. Thank you very much, Michael. And thank you to all of you. I mean, we're, we're running quite short on time, actually. And so what I'm going to do is I had a couple of questions left. I'm going to combine them and I'm going to ask you, each of you, very, very quickly. So it'll only be about one minute each. Uh, I'm sorry about that, but that's, that's where we are with the time. So one minute each to please tell, tell us what do you see as potential no regret investment areas in your business? And secondly, what could you commit to doing in the future? Something very pragmatic, something we want to do to end this session is to say, look, we've talked about the big imaginative, creative idea of scenarios. But we want to translate into tangible action that can help us prepare for a better future. Okay, so I'd like those two things. So uh, your view on a no regret investment um, and your view on the, something you can commit to that's hard. For those of you in the audience, while this is happening, you can go to Mentimeter and give your own view on commitments. We can look at that afterwards. But in the meantime, let's go back to our panel. That, that can happen in the background in Mentimeters. Michele, while you're talking, let's go back to you and we'll go backwards through the sure. group again. Your no regret investment and your commitment. Uh, well, I mentioned it before, for sure, my no regret investment was uh, uh, people, and uh, I realized that they're pivotal. So uh, one uh, is people and one is strategy, because we would have not been able to invest in people and technology in this moment if we didn't have a strategy of saving for those, uh, you know, disaster recovery funds that we managed to use right now, even in the moment of crisis. Uh, the commitment right now is... Uh, uh, keep investing in people and look for what are all those classes, all those trainings that they can do to elevate their, their competencies. I mean, someone pretty famous said, don't hire smart people and tell them what to do, but let them tell you what to do. And that I think would be our greatest achievement looking at the future. Perfect. Thank you very much, Michele. Thank you. Uh, Nora, let's turn to you. So your no regret investment and your commitment for the future. Um, sure. Um, my no regret investment would definitely be in technology. So actually investing in a platform for e-courses, for workshops, for webinars to distribute my content further. And this leads me to a, my second uh, point, which is the future commitment. Something very dear to heart is um, actually um, adding to the Arabic content on mental health and well-being, which has a lot of room for improvement and development, especially in such pivotal times. It's more important than ever to translate and enrich on uh, psychology and emotional well-being, and I intend to do more of that. Fantastic. Very good. Thank you, Nora. Uh, Dunjiao, let's hear from you. Your no regret investment and your commitment. Yeah, I didn't talk to Michele in uh, advance, but I totally agree with him. Uh, for sure, my no regret investment would be also on people. Uh, I have noticed that uh, a person who has a uh, diverse experience, so for instance, living in many countries, uh, tend to be more resilient. Um, it is uh, impossible almost to have a person who is uh, infinitely resilient, but I think it is possible to build a team 
that is resilient by having a more diverse team. So uh, you know that's a something specific that we are doing. We're a very young team. Average age is, I think, uh, 25. So we're now hiring more older people. Um, we also uh, formed like a stakeholder committee. Uh, for instance, the teachers from schools, uh, officials from governments, uh, uh, professors from, from academia, uh, journalists from media, um, and also student members who are you know only 10 years old or so uh, to give us advice on various parts of our strategy and operations. And in hiring, we are also looking more into diversity. Um, you know, we had uh, multi Chinese before, but now we're looking into hiring people with different races, different cultures, different religions. And I think that is that uh, people, uh, teams uh, that are resilient can take us to a, a more uncertain future and, uh, and a brighter future. In terms of uh, commitment, um, I think it's also related to this. Um, this time we had a, a, a physical virus that had huge disruptions in the physical world. But who knows, maybe next time we have a digital virus that has a huge disruption in, to, in the digital world. Um, so I think in terms of commitment, we are also uh, diversifying our operations. So I've noticed recently that lots of offline, offline uh, businesses are struggling, uh, hotels, real estate companies, uh, supermarkets, you know, travel agencies. Uh, and as I mentioned, I believe learning is a blended experience. You know, in the time of social distancing, you can use digital technology to complement intimacy, but it's never as good as face-to-face -face, uh, learning, uh, at least for the next, uh, you know, five decades. Uh, so we are now approaching um, the offline uh, scenarios, the offline uh, places uh, to, to build them into learning centers. I believe, you know, in the future, uh, all these uh, businesses I mentioned can have a role uh, also in learning. Uh, so, uh, and I believe all these uh, offline businesses, they're all thinking about this digital transformation to diversify their user experience so that when you're buying a, a, a milk or um, an egg, uh, maybe you can also learn something. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, uh, that's my sharing. Um, and I hope that uh, we can have more diverse and uh, 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 friendly and intellectual and stimulating sharing sessions like this so that you know uh, we can all uh, go to a brighter future together. Very good. Thank you so much, Tin Zhao. Um, just in the interest of the time, Kitty, let's very quickly move on to you. And there's Louis as well. So Kitty, please. Sure, thank you. So for us, there would be two things. So the first one is keep our radar on um, what's going wrong what's going on around the world and what we can do and we might do. And so we participate in this humanitarian events every year, evaluating problems that we could help with. And so that is definitely something we continue doing. And the second one is of course, the talent side of things and um, bringing out good side of people and then work with the similar uh, people with a similar mindset in order to, to make real impact. Uh, commitment. Uh, for us, next stage is to secure funding from grants and philanthropists, idea, uh, ideally, for us to bring smile to, to the field and to reach out to everyone, however difficult the journey is. And at the same time, we're also working with organizations who can be agile and make good decisions. Excellent. Thank you, Kitty. And finally, Louis, let's hear from you. Yes, very quickly. So definitely my no regrets investment uh, is people. Uh, my main activity is uh, caregiver. So without caregivers, uh, we cannot do our business. And we are redesigning all the, you know, the way we pay them. Uh, and in France, it's very difficult to have a good wage for uh, this kind of uh, professionals. Uh, and second, my uh, commitment for the future would be the technology. Uh, especially for our second uh, activity, like medical e equipment, uh, because we believe that there is possibilities, there are possibilities to uh, form uh, our clients um, via the technology uh, in order to, uh, you know, to set up things. So I would say that it's definitely technology. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, all of you. Um, this has been fantastic. I'm afraid we've run out of time. I can tell you. By